Well, welcome to Lake and Bethel. My name is Sherwin. I'm the pastor here. Just a reminder to our video audience, we have two services every Sunday, one at 9 and one at 11. And it's, as always, good to have you with us. Today I'm talking about Jesus' teaching on salt and light. And I would be not doing justice to that if I didn't have someone come up and try some Dutch licorice. So Paula, can I get you to come on up here a minute? Paula has so graciously volunteered to do the taste testing for us today, and she promised not to hit me. So it's, it should be good. So Paula, if you come on up. Now there's, I've got two kinds of Dutch licorice here. You can just kind of take your pick, and the, the mints are for afterwards. No, you got to try one of those I first. Know, I gotta oh. have this in my hand. You gotta have you, that. You know how fussy I am. All right, now just uh, <laughs> chomp down on that, and here's a napkin if you need it. Oh, what the? <laughs> That's nasty. It is nasty. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there yeah. goes. The, now these are these are special peppermints. Too. These are Wilhelmina peppermints, and if you don't bite on them, they'll last through the entire sermon. Okay. Very good. You want to take uh, this uh, home with you? No. no. No, that is that's that's bad. That's bad stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you, Paula, for being uh, a willing participant today. Now, believe it or not, Paula, my grandpa liked that stuff, and he kept a little bag of it on the tractors, so that he, you know, as he was going through the cornfields doing whatever it is he did. It would keep him from falling asleep. I don't know how it kept him from not throwing up, but he, he seemed to really like it and uh, did it. But you know, when you think about salt, and that's what this is, it's called salted licorice or double zoot. Uh, you can buy it at Meyer, believe it or not. Uh, not the one in North Muskegon, but you can, I saw it at the, uh, the one on Norton. And uh, now don't all make a rush to Meyer as soon as the service is over to go buy that stuff out. But you can get it there. I bought it at uh, the peanut store in Holland before also. And, and uh, it's, it's just kind of a nasty thing. I tried to get Tina to take it, but she wouldn't do it. She said, she's, I've given it to her before. Did I? And you didn't like it either? No? OK. Um, but anyway, it's, it's kind of a Dutch treat. You know, we know that uh, we like salt in our food because low salt foods just taste nasty. Some of you remember Bill Wilbrandt and he was, uh, he was actually working in his retirement years as a celery buyer for Campbell's who makes V8 juice. And he was always trying to get me to drink V8 juice whenever I went to his house. But he said, yeah, we make a, a low salt version of it, but nobody buys it because it tastes so nasty. So we didn't do that, you know, but sodium or salt is a, a valid seasoning. And, uh, you know, we use salt for various things. When, uh, when we were in the dog business uh, back home, you know, you'd have like nine female Labradors. And uh, at certain times of the year, the, all the dogs for miles around would get these romantic inclinations and want to come over. And if you put a, a 12 gauge shotgun shell with water softener salt in it, that would scare them off pretty good. It seemed like that was a, a good deterrent. It must have stung pretty good. Um, you all heard it said, don't put salt in the wound. Don't rub salt in a wound because it hurts. But salt does disinfect and it, it works that way. Salt is also a preservative. We used to eat dried beef with lots of salt in it, our beef jerky. It's got lots of salt in it because the salt actually preserves the meat. We use salt to soften our water. We use salt to melt ice. Ford and GM and Chrysler really like the fact that we use salt on our roads because then the cars rust and we go buy new ones. So we use salt as a uh, means of melting the ice off the road. We have the expression, he's worth his salt. And that actually comes from the old Roman times when Roman soldiers were sometimes paid in salt. It was that valuable of a commodity that they could do it. And the Latin word for salt is where we get the word salary from. Not salary is in the green stuff, but salary is what comes in your paycheck. But mostly we use salt as a seasoning. 
you know, and we probably all have it on our tables. Today we talk about how Jesus asked us all to be salt and light. And as we think about that, as we're getting into that passage in just a moment here, whenever you hear that, you think, well, I can't be salt and light because I'm not good enough. I can't do this because I'm too flawed, I'm too broken. And then you have to look at the context of Jesus' teaching here on the Sermon on the Mount. You know, it's Matthew chapters 5 through 7 is really the core of his teaching. But if you look at it, the immediate context from the last few paragraphs of chapter 4, the author of Matthew describes the crowds that were following Jesus. And he does it, it kind of interesting, in a kind of an interesting way. He says, all those who were ill, which comes from, the Greek word there is kakos, and it just means messed up. And then it says, some who came were tortured. They used the word basanois, which is a military term for uh, the Roman equivalent to waterboarding, pretty much. It was, it was a way of torturing people. And then, of course, there was the demon-possessed. And today, what we call mental illness is pretty much what they call demon possession in those days. But then there's a word that puzzled me because it's left out of most of the contemporary English translations of the Bible. The old King James has it. And it's, it's really a doozy of a word. It's Selenia Zomenos. And the King James translates it as lunatic. It actually says lunatic in the King James Version, that these were the people that were coming to see Jesus, the mentally ill. And then, of course, the paralyzed, those who were immobilized. But as I looked at that list and that description of the crowds that were following Jesus, I kind of felt at home. You know, these are the people that I see all the time. And I noticed that there were more mental things than physical things that Jesus was healing these people of. And these people were all the marginalized ones, the ones that society tried to push us to the side and ignore. And Matthew chapter 4 says Jesus healed them all, which is just kind of interesting. And then he gives this teaching to his inner circle his apprentices, as I said last week, are his disciples. And there again, the Greek word is simply his learners, the people that were learning from him. And it's to these folks that Jesus says this. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. See, so you are the salt of the earth, not the cleaned up version of you, not the version of you that goes to seminary for, sen for seven years, the way you are today, the way God created you. The interesting thing in this passage is that your inadequacies don't matter. Jesus is just saying here, don't get deluded. Don't get deluded by trying to be what the world wants you to be. Don't get deluded by becoming fake. Jesus later talks about the Pharisees, this hyper-religious group, you know, it's the, the right-wingers of the day. He says, don't be like the Pharisees. They go to great lengths to hide their brokenness. They go to great lengths to appear to be righteous. And it's their phoniness that caused them to lose their flavor. Their self-righteousness <coughs> is what deluded them. So what Jesus is saying here is be your real broken self in everything. And he goes on and says this, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out 
for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So we get to shine a light on all the world's phoniness. You know, this world wants us to be champions. Everybody wants to be a champion, you know, and have other people sing our praises and all that. But in order to be a champion, that involves a lot of pretense. One of my kids went to a Christian college in Chicago. She came home one time saying, well, what she had learned was you got to fake it until you make it. I said, that is exactly the opposite of what Jesus teaches. You don't fake it. Your goal has to be integrity. Now, everyone here is broken. We're all sinners. We're all messed up. And our calling is to show mercy in the midst of that brokenness. Your job is to bring a heavy dose of grace to a merciless world. So let your good deeds shine. Be so busy doing good that you don't have time to do anything bad. And the more good you do, the more, the brighter the light shines through you. So here's some takeaways for you. You are good enough just the way you are. You don't have to change the thing. You're good enough to be the light of the world. Jesus did not say you have to jump through all these hoops to be the light of the world. You're the light of the world right now. Kind of a scary thought, isn't it? But that's what he said. You can be the salt of the earth by showing grace. You know, the blandness of a life of self-service is, is just meaningless. The blandness of you know, working all your life to get ahead so that you can have a nice coffin when you die is, is meaningless. You can salt things up. You can help people connect with God. Not by pretending to have it all together, because you don't, but by being real about your own situation. You can be light by treating others the way you want to be treated. Your good deeds, as this passage says, can be evident to all. Uh, you remember why the first generation of Christians multiplied so fast. They didn't have a Bible. They didn't have a building. They just had a message accompanied by good deeds. The Roman government did not have child protective services. If a kid lost his parents, he was just dumped out on the street to forage on his own. If you simply didn't like your kids, you could kick them out and they were on their own. That was a legal thing to do. And it, so what happened like in the city of Rome, there were all these, what they called street urchins, running around foraging for food, stealing stuff just so they could survive. The Christians made a point of taking those kids in. They adopted them, gave them their names, and that got noticed. And they did the same thing with widows. You know, if you were the widow of a soldier who got killed, you were just out of luck. The government didn't take care of you. You were just simply cast out, homeless. The Christians started taking care of these widows and their families. They took care of the broken. They helped those that society and the government discarded. And it spread like wildfire because Christians were not pushing a political agenda. They were following the teaching of Jesus that simply said, love your neighbor as yourself. So they took care of these people and Christianity became the dominant faith of the region over a matter of about 150 years. 
it spread that well and it can spread like that again. You can let your good deeds shine too. You know, this rummage sale for hand to hand is just one example of that, of how people got together. Tons of volunteers, people volunteering for that, like we had lots of hands on it. But it goes to the proceeds go to hand to hand, which feeds hungry kids. Kind of like what the first generation of Christians did. Now, that fellow that hooked me up with hand to hand is Greg Vandermeer. He came to me and asked if we'd be interested in it. And uh, we got to talking about the effect that COVID has on our churches. Greg used to be the pastor at Fellowship here in Muskegon. Now he's at Fair Haven in Jenison. And we talked about the devastation that COVID has had on the churches. Like for us, we're running about 65% of what we were three years ago. And the same thing happened to him, only that's a much bigger church, but they've lost 500 people through the COVID thing. And I said, well, what's that, what's that do to you, Greg? You know, because it has really discouraged me. And he said, well, you know, it's discouraging, but it also gives a, us a level of freedom. As we realize that now we have been set free to be like Jesus, and we can go around feeding hungry kids and doing the things that Jesus did without having to worry about building an empire because it could be taken away just in a flash. And he's so motivated to feed kids that I bought into it and now you all have. And that's a cool thing. It's a cool thing to see how that's, that's worked out. You've heard me use Colossians 3.17. It's kind of a personal mission statement. And it's very simple. It says, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. You've heard me say that once or twice. And it's an interesting thing. We are called to be representatives of Jesus. We're called to be the salt and the light. And there's a little voice in the back of your head that says, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. I can't. And no one is. The good news is we're all messed up. Every one of us. In my experience, I've seen two kinds of Christians. Those who think they're good enough and those who know they're not. And the ones who think they're good enough are deluded. They're self-deceived. And it's so much easier to live with knowing you're not good enough. It's a blessing. I've said many times, if you're not saved by grace, you're not saved. Because it's the only way to be saved. God created you the way you are for a reason. And if you let your good deeds shine, you're going to help others find God too. Because that's how it works. Jesus is the light of the world. And he chose you and me to be reflections of that light. You can do this. You don't have to be good enough. Don't try to fake it with me because, you know, I'm old and experienced. I know you're broken, and I know I'm broken. So accept that, and let the light of Jesus shine through you. Now, what one of my teachers said, and what I really like, is put this into practice by doing one good deed a day. And it won't take long and your life will become a record of good deeds. Say one kind word to somebody every day and your whole world changes. Do one unexpected service a day and you will change your world. So let your light shine. And remember, in your broken state, in your confusion, in your frustration with yourself, 
in all of these things, remember, you are the salt of the earth. When Jesus said this, he did not say, you will become the salt of the earth. But he said, just as you are, you are the salt of the earth. So get busy and let your good deeds shine. Let me pray with you. Let's pray. Lord, what a strange group you've called to be the salt of the earth. Christians all over the world to be the seasoning to bring you out. And every one of us is broken. And we're thankful that you extend your hand of grace to each one of us and let, and so that we can let your light shine through us. Now give us the courage to let that happen in each of our lives. And help everyone here to accept themselves just as you have accepted us. Amen. Well, to the uh, video audience, thanks for tuning in. As always, thanks for listening. And uh, we'll see you next week when I talk about Jesus' role of the law and how many rules did Jesus break. So feel free to tune in for that. <laughs>